All right, if you'll open your Bible, please, to 1 Peter, in the first epistle of Peter, and we're going to be looking at, verse, at chapter 4, and our scripture reading is going to be beginning at verse 12. 1 Peter, chapter 4, beginning at verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous Sacrif uh, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Our Heavenly Father, how we are so thankful for this blessed text. In this epistle, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God through the Apostle Peter to the saints scattered abroad, many going through very difficult times of great suffering for the name of Christ in that uh, early apostolic church. But to be encouraged in this message from the Lord Jesus Christ to them. To count it all glory even now in times of difficulty, in times of testings, in times of suffering and tribulation and even looking forward to that greater glory that shall be ours in Christ when we are entered into his glory when we see him face to face. I pray, dear Heavenly Father, that each one of us here today might be able to have the proper perspective with respect to this text and its bearing on our lives every single day that we might not look at the things that are seen, but that are unseen, that are promised in the word of God concerning the glory to follow, but also to understand with our minds and apply it with our faith in a daily obedience to the reason why, the why God brings these things into our lives so that our faith might come forth the finer. Bless thy words to our hearts, obedience and to our minds understanding that we might understand thy will and then walk in its light. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now, there's one thing that the Word of God tells us very clearly is that we are to expect difficult situations in our lives. And I believe that this text is incredibly important as we compare it with some surrounding this so that we understand that even though we're going through hard times at times, and especially as we've come through this recession and we're not through it yet. And there's, have you ever known a time in, in your life when there's been so much anxiety and apprehension about what lies ahead? Lot, not to mention the difficulties all are called upon to experience today. That's one thing about the ministry here. We hear from people across the country and in other countries. And just godly people have, you know, lost their jobs and, and the physical situations people are in or their loved ones and that we might even be experiencing ourselves at time seem absolutely overwhelming. And so many times it's the spirit of, well, why would God do this to me? Or in speaking to somebody in flying back from Houston here recently and, and to uh, someone who said, well, you know, things are so terrible today. And, you know, how can this all happen? And it, but it's so wonderful that those of us who know Christ as our Savior and understand Bible truth, this is a sin-cursed world. And, and the effects of sin are on every hand. But the thing is that is so wonderful is that we do have a Heavenly Father 
that we do have the shepherd of our souls, the Lord Jesus Christ, who acts as a shepherd, who loves and cares for his sheep and even gave his shed blood for their redemption. And so, yes, we do have a God who cares, but we need to be aligned to the will of God concerning the times of distress and tribulation and problems each one of us find ourselves in just about continually so that we might be able to say, not our will, but thine be done. And in so doing then, receive that grace and strength to enter into that victory over those times of seeming discouragement now and physical pain and sickness and whatever it might be and for prayers for, for loved ones and neighbors and, and just the burden that God has placed upon our hearts for others but to be able to have that confidence that truly his will shall be done. And so we, don't, we must not think it strange when uh, the fiery trials and the difficulties come our way in each one of our lives. We find that in verse 12 of our text. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. No, it's, uh, that's the way it's always been for God's people. That's the way it's always going to be for God's people. It's going to continue to be that way for God's people until God's people are forever with their Lord. And that we will enter into that future glory, which is, again, a, a reflection of the absolute infinite glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But see, that the thing about it is, though, is that just as our text revealed to us as we read it earlier, we can enter into, by faith, a sense of that glory of being in fellowship and communion with the Savior and with the abiding Holy Spirit of God within to be able to give us a different perspective. I know that's what Pastor Matt, remember, has been dealing with time and again. We need to look, to look through the biblical perspective of how God deals with His own and the great and precious promises that are contained therein so that we can even find days of great difficulty. Days of seeming darkness and discouragement can also be days of great hope and expectation, confident expectation, that according to God's will, we will get through those times and even come through the better and the stronger. And so think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. God has his reasons that's what we need to understand. God has his reasons for such occurrences. And we as believers must by faith rejoice now, by faith, and await the glory to be revealed later. Notice verse 13. But rejoice, in other words, we can rejoice now. The ones being addressed in the early church could rejoice even in the midst of a difficult uh, uh, terrible situation that they were experiencing, but no, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, because all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, that's an element of that, but that when he, but that when his glory shall be revealed, and when that, when is that glory going to be revealed? When we see him face to face, either when he returns in his glory, to catch away the the church to be received unto himself in the rapture, or whether it be in death when we enter into that glory of the very presence, to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord, and we enter into that glory. See, we have that continually before us, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. We need to face each difficult day and each day that's seemingly going well, because if that's the case, then it's only going to be a few days later when something's going to come along, God is going to allow something to come along to again cause us to readjust our anticipation and our expectation of what is present and what is ahead in light of what he said is certainly going to come to pass. And so we are, can rejoice now even in, and even when there is heaviness of heart, even when times are difficult, because there's going to be a final future revelation of what is truly worthwhile for, through all eternity when we are with our Savior. Hold your place here and turn back, if you will, to chapter 1 and verse 6 through 9. It deals with the same 
glorious expectation, even though in the midst of trial and tribulation now, as those that were being specifically addressed here by the Apostle Peter in this general epistle. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 6, wherein you greatly rejoice, talking about that that's going to be revealed in the last time with his glory, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now, see, right now, for a season, for a period of time, we don't know how long, God alone knows, if need be, and it's not whether we think we need it or not, it's whether God thinks we need it or not, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, trials, testings, does it mean that the Christian should always be going through every situation in life and just, whoa, everything's praise the Lord and everything's fine and put on a pseudo pious exaltation that's of the flesh and really not of the spirit? There are times when there's tears in the eyes, when our hearts are heavy, when we go through times of distress, heaviness. But see, that again is a time that God brings our way as he deems necessary so that we might experience the following. You're in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith, that's trusting the word of God, revealing, revealing his will for us, even though we don't know the end of that yet, as far as our own practical experience, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, at the appearing of Jesus Christ, uh, whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. In other words, that time when we will experience that future aspect of our salvation in Christ, and that is the redemption of our very bodies to be at home with the Lord. You see, there's that promise here that the Apostle Peter is giving those being addressed and to us today, that we can, even in times of heaviness, even in times of extremity, and, and we realize that there's so many things that we're facing that we just don't have the ability of ourselves. And and so many times, don't you find that a lot of times our heaviness and all has to do with others that we love and we're concerned about, but we just can't do anything to help them, seemingly? See, that's what is so wonderful about God's process of maturing us in Christ. It's through the understanding of the Word of God that when we submit ourselves to God's will and we commit others through fervent intercessory prayer that God's will might be worked out through them, even though we can't do what we wish we could do for them right now. That's the wonderful thing about it. See, when we commit others and, and problems and situations in our own hearts, our own, our own spiritual condition for that matter, to the Lord Jesus Christ and praying for His will to be done in us, to the operation of His Word and the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within then see, we have someone that not only understands our every need, brings along the testing to refine our faith so that that need will become something that causes us to grow instead of to complain and to faint and become discouraged. And then he also has that mighty power through the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within to accomplish his perfect will in us. And we will come forth the finer. It's just, this is such a glorious epistle because it's written to people who are really suffering. And because of living the Christian life, the way the Christian life should be lived, as we shall see. And so we, we just got a wonderful uh, thesis here in that first chapter of what God wants to have accomplished in us. The better we understand why God brings times of difficulty and allows them in our lives and distresses and infirmities the better we can enter into the wherefore. In other words, why has God done this? And to experience through that the why, to experience his enabling grace and his unfeigned constant love for us as a father for a child. The believer is in this time of testing for four reasons that we're going to be looking at today. First of all, it's to discover 
God's purpose. God brings uh, times of testing, times of trial into our lives so that we can wake up to what God wants to do and needs to do in our lives and in our hearts and in our minds and our attention upon him. He is the one who has determined that this trial was necessary for us right now. Sometime the hardship is for the purpose of chastening. We find that in Hebrews chapter 12. We've gone over that before, and I know Pastor Matt has too, so we're not going to go into it now. But in discovering God's purpose, sometimes we need to read over very carefully Hebrews chapter 12 and verses 5 through 11. Now, we all know what that's about. God says he'll chasten every son that he believeth, that he receiveth. And that there's going to be times when we are walking out of the way, when we have hearts that are really not tender toward the things of the word, and, and we're not really where we should be. And there will be times, it, it is the purpose of God at times to bring affliction or bring whatever is necessary to cause us to say, oh, I need to, there's, Lord, is there something in my heart? that it's not right with you? Is there something that I'm desiring and, and clamoring after and forcing, you know, a head in that is not really your will? Will? Am I really abiding in Christ every day? Do I really have a right relationship with him in prayer? Am I in fellowship with Christ? Am I abiding in Christ as the branch in the vine so that fruit will be produced? And that fruit is what we're going to be looking at produced by the Holy Spirit of God that does provide a taste of heaven on earth right now, that glory which is to follow can be a time of joy and rejoicing in our hearts right now, even though we're still in the midst of a difficult situation. But see, if we're not right with the Lord, then there's times of chastening that will come our way where we need to be brought by the Spirit of God to that place of repentance, where first of all, we acknowledge, we understand that we're not where we should be. And then we confess that as sin to the Lord. And then we receive His cleansing. And that's what the end of that portion in Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11 is. It says, you know, instead of uh, the lame being turned out of the way, in other words, the, it's, the picture there is a son just limping along and it's just a miserable existence. Instead of being turned out farther away from the way of truth and walking in fellowship with the Lord, which will be the end of one who continues in their sin. He says, rather let them be healed. In other words, to get back not only upon the path of righteousness and following after God according to his will, but also it's a path where we can walk by the fullness of the spirit and by the power of God's grace to be what he wants us to be. So one of the purposes of times of affliction could be that of the need for dealing with sin in our own lives. Other times, to engender uh, humility and strength that is needed as well. Turn over, if you will, just a moment to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Here's a situation here where the Apostle Paul, and I'm sure you're all familiar with this too, but I'd like to read this over here just quickly where he besought the Lord three times concerning a thorn in the flesh that he had. Now, he wasn't in a wrong relationship with the Lord as far as his fellowship with him, but he still had something that was a tribulation. It was a trial. It was a thorn in his flesh, whatever that might have been. And he prayed about it. He said, Lord, just remove this from me. But this could be another purpose that is discovered as we first of all examine our own hearts to see whether we're really right with God. And then if there's other matters that we just really would like to have relief from, and we can be praying about that and with importunity three times, you know, he just kept going. And, uh, but don't notice what his, the answer was the Lord gave to him. Sometimes the Lord doesn't articulate it to us like he did to the Apostle Paul, but the same is true for us. We need to take that reality that Paul experienced to say, well, this is what God might be saying to me about this. I've got this physical problem. I've got this financial problem. I've got this interrelationship problem. I've got this family problem. I've got this work problem. And Lord, if you know my heart is, you know, I, I really want your will to be done. And, and what could be the reason why this hasn't been removed? Well, here could be the answer. 
Verse 9, he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect. That's my strength. God's strength is made perfect or brought to fruition, to maturity, to completion in weakness. Whose weakness? See, that problem we're having, that situation that's just out of my hands. I can't do anything about it. I don't have the strength. I, I'm, I, I've got an infirmity here, whether it's physical, whether it's whatever it might be. And then because of that statement being made by God to Paul, he said, listen, yes, you've got a thorn in the flesh, but it's not my will to heal you of that, to provide you with deliverance, but I've got something better. And that is for you to experience in that time my grace. You don't deserve it. See, it's grace. It's unmerited favor. But I will provide you with that grace, with that strength to bear up under that infirmity. It's not one of chastisement, but it's just something God allows and continues in our lives so that we might experience that Joy unspeakable and full of glory that First Peter chapter 1 was talking about. Until we have those new bodies someday. See, there's not going to be problems like that. But right now, right now we can say, yes, Lord. I know it. This, this physical problem really problem bothers me. And, and what hurts more is when it's in someone we love and we, we see them suffering. And we've got people that really need to have the Spirit of God really work in their hearts and unsaved need to get saved. But as long as there's those things that we want, we want for God to move and make it right and, and work, he'll put things in our own lives that will cause us to see. Boy, there's going to be times when you will be drawn closer to me when you say, Lord, may your will be done and not mine in this matter. And then to experience that grace and that strength that he alone provides. And that, notice... The change of attitude here of Paul, beginning in the next verb, next sentence. Most gladly, therefore, well, now look, listen to this. See, we're talking about the preparation in the life right now for the great glory to follow when we're with our Lord. But there's elements of glory right now in the midst of even hard times, difficulties, burdens of hearts, tears in the eyes, and, and all the rest. Because it says this, I would rather glory in my infirmities, the problem I have right now, that the power of Christ might rest upon me. <laughs> Notice the emphasis there. It's not solving a problem that we're facing. It's not getting somebody else's problem straightened out. It isn't God doing some mighty work of deliverance in the person we've been praying for, either for their salvation or for God to get them right you know, to where they should be and all the rest and make the job situation better and make the financial problems go away. No, he says, I'll, I'll bring these times of problems and distress to you so that, as it says here, the power of Christ might, may rest upon me. See what I mean? That's what God wants for all of us. And when we are humbly genuinely abiding in Christ every day, dealing with sin in the life. Yes, praying about things that are all things, you know, that trouble us and trouble others and all the rest, but it, it should be that it's God's purpose to have those things continue. Then that opens a way for us to say, now the power of Christ rests upon me in a way it never was experienced before. Think about that. It's a completely different perspective to look upon problems that we all face that we have no control over. We pray for God to take those problems away, bring an answer to those problems out there or even in here when all along God says, well, you leave that to me. And it could very well be like Paul was told here, you're going to be strengthened in your relationship with Christ by just saying, Lord, not my will but thine be done. And it says here that when I am weak, and verse 10 again, therefore I take pleasure, uh, I'm sorry, that the power of Christ might rest upon me, therefore I take pleasure. By pleasure meaning I experience something really good from God. 
I take pleasure in infirmities. That's my limitations, my weaknesses. In reproaches, in other words, those from the outside that were bring, being problematic by, because of individuals against the Apostle Paul. In distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. So, discover God's purpose. And so, therefore, it's such a wonderful thing to understand that God does answer prayer. But if it doesn't seem that he's answering the prayer that we want answered right now, then that's when we need to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And I pray for the grace and the strength to give me the right, not only perspective and attitude about the problem that I've been praying about or the individual or the situation I've been praying about, but Lord, make me stronger through this to trust you even more. And that is even glory. But in our particular text here, over if you'll turn back to uh, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, you notice here that we're not talking about a situation of sinful behavior where there is need of repentance and renewal. But what we're talking about here is a situation where they were su suffering according to the will of God. And there's sometimes when this is one of the purposes of God where the trial of faith is not due to sin in the life to bring us back to a right relationship with him, as Hebrews tells us there. Uh, nor is it the type of thing where there's a thorn in the flesh or some kind of physical infirmity or limitation that infirmity that we might be experiencing in our own lives individually or those in our family or in our church or those that we know and problems at the work and the job. And, and you know, it isn't because of sin on our part, or, but it's just that, you know, God has brought those things, allowed those things to come along to, to just strengthen us to trust God for the grace to deal with it. And even that makes us strong in Christ. You know what I mean? There's a tremendous fringe benefit to coming to the end of our, oh, why is this continuing? Oh, I just getting me down. I can't sleep at night. You know, it just way, way, way down. Boy, if you say, Lord, if it's not your will to take this thorn in the flesh away, then Lord, help me to experience that sustaining grace and the strength that you have for me to receive when I say, Lord, may your will be done in this. But in the text that we're looking at in 1 Peter chapter 4, here we see a situation in verse 19, in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 19, if you'll notice this. Wherefore, and this is the context in this particular chapter, let them that suffer according to the will of God. In other words, it's not God's will to deliver from a particular thing that has been a thorn in the flesh that they've been praying about, but they're, they're experiencing difficulty, tribulation, a fiery trial because of the reaction of others because of your stand upon the truth of the word of God and your purpose to do everything for God's glory and not to please people. Yes, we love people. We want to minister to people. We want to be a witness to the lost. We want to be a good ambassador for Christ to a lost and dying world. But if there's opposition, and there will be, to your walk of faith, and your insistence and making that known that you're going to do what God's will is no matter what. You want to place, please him instead of men. You want to be true to the word of God instead of what's just politically correct and acceptable and common goodness as defined by the world today. You'll stand out like a sore thumb and you also get hit with a hammer on that sore thumb a lot by people. You'll suffer according, accordingly. So now we come to verse 19. Let's go ahead and read it, Dennis. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God. I tell you, some Christians are outside the will of God, and they don't experience this kind of suffering, this kind of notoriety for being a, somebody that's just too implacable. You know, they're just too set in their ways, and they're, to stalwart, <laughs> standing upon the truth of the word of God. Now listen to this. 
Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit. And here's the thing. It's another understanding of what God's will is. And then it's an, a, 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 it's an action. It's a motivation by a heart that's right with God to commit our conduct, our everything concerning this issue at hand for God's will to be done. Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing. See, as we're desiring to be the kind of Christian God wants us to be, to be the kind of witness God wants us to be, to be the kind of mom and dad God wants us to be, to be the kind of young person God wants you to be. You commit yourselves to doing what you know is God's will for you, and in doing so, there'll be a lot of problems along the way because this old world is no friend of grace. It's not helping you on toward better relationships with God. There's going to be opposition to a consistent witness for Christ, not only with our lips, but also with our actions and also with our heart, reflected in how we pray for God's will to be done concerning all things concerning us and others. But when we do that, and that's one of the greatest purposes of God through these tribulations, have the proper perspective of everything concerning us every day. It needs to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And here's and the ones being addressed here who are you know, suffering because of their stand for the truth in this uh, culture in the, in the early church, especially many of these being Jews who had come to know Christ as their Savior, they were suffering at the hands of their own uh, brethren after the flesh as well as the pagan culture. They were, they were suffering terribly for that. But when they're desirous of doing the will of God as they know it to be and being true to him and his word, look at this. The keep, they commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Now that shows the power of the shepherd of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. He is the creator of all things. By Him, His very words, He spoke the, the universe into existence. By Him, all things were created. By Him, all things consist. And so we have a creator who is omnipotent, all-powerful. But He also is a shepherd who cares for His sheep who loves us more than we could ever, ever even imagine now. And we'll all, we, I think we'll only enter into it in his fullness as time goes by in eternity. His love for us. His care for us. Now, if we stop right there, we think, well, okay, uh, there's nothing that I'm going to be facing uh, this afternoon or tonight, tomorrow, uh, the, rest, the rest of the time until the Lord takes us home that uh, is out of the scope of God's great and precious promises here in this, in this blessed epistle. Yes, uh, we are to commit ourselves in well-doing, in doing what his will is, is unto a faithful creator. That's on the purpose. We must always keep in mind that sometimes it is the will of God to experience trial, even in this well-doing. Notice in our text, back in chapter 3 and verse 17, back in uh, chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 17, for it is better if the will of God be so that ye, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. What, what, and it deals with this later in, in the text here also that, yes, there can also be suffering because we bring it, on, bring it upon ourselves because of our own sin. We can't ask God to bless our foolishness, our disobedience, our disregard for his word. That's just a word of warning kind of put in here as we go along. But see, that's why it's so very important that if it is a need, a time of testing for our refinement with respect to the need for repentance and dealing with sin in our lives or carnality or whatever it might be, that we deal with that. Because until we do, we cannot enter into this special care and love and protection and provision of his grace and his care and his leading for those 
who are abiding in Christ. See what I mean? It's a, it's a package deal. We can't just pick and choose what we want to obey and profit from, from the Word of God, and then go our merry way in some other area of our life and expect God to then bless with these blesses, blessed promises here being fulfilled in our time of great need. We need to walk in fellowship with Him. And so we need to also then not only discover God's purpose, whether that's a need for cleansing in our lives, whether it's a need for trusting Him more, and especially if we pray for something that we would like to have resolved, but He says, no, my grace is going to be made perfect, and you're going to be strengthened in the midst of that. I'm going to be faithful in providing you with all you need so that you will be able to rejoice even in that time of distress or even a removal of the same if it's His will. But in the midst also of this time of distress, we need to rest, secondly, in his promises. A Christian who so commits himself to God's will is assured, is assured God's infinite care as that faithful creator we just read about in chapter 4 and verse 19. It may seem that the suffering saint is bearing far too much of a load. But compare this with those who know not Christ, consider therein. Look at verses 16 through 18 again. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, so we need to deal with sin in our own hearts. That's always a preface to anything good as God is going to do for his church or for any individual believer. It must start with our own self-judgment before God, 1 John 1, 9. And if it first begin at us, in other words, this is what God requires of us as Christians. We need to deal with reality, spiritual reality in our own lives if we are to receive the experience of a faithful creator to be our joy, to be our strength, to work wonderful miracles of deliverance or provide grace and strength that will result in joy unspeakable and full of glory, 1 Peter Chapter 1, it's wonderful. But if it is required of us as Christians, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And that the righteous scarcely be saved. In other words, it's not by anything they can do, but it's by the shed blood of Christ alone. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? See, the thing is this, is that there's no possible way that we can experience the fullness of our God unless we understand his holiness and the end of those who, first of all, don't know Christ as their Savior. That's eternity in the lake of fire. Think of that. But God is also very jealous about our fidelity to him and that he also has our hearts. He also has our upward look and our eyes set upon his word as it reveals his will and that straight path that he wants us to walk in that will glorify him. See, we need to take this very ser seriously. Even testing for the cause of needed correction is, is administered in divine faithfulness. And again, turn back to that Hebrews chapter 12 portion later, verses 5 through 11, and you'll see that a loving father administers the rod only as needed and then for the betterment of the er errant child. Always remember that. Yes, he will bring chastisement. But it's according to his perfect understanding of what we need. And he loves us too much for us to continue on in disregard for him and for his perfect will for us. See what I mean? I've been saved for a long time. I was saved on August 17th, 1957. And I can remember through the years, I think, boy, you know, I'm just got a lot... Just like my second or third grade teacher said to my mother one time a, a review of how little Dennis was doing. And I still, and this still rings in my ears. Mrs. Hawking said to my mother, I was sitting over there a little far away, and she said, well, Dennis is a good boy, but he's got a lot of room for improvement. <laughs> and that's almost been the slogan for my life. It seems like, you know, you, you have that desire, you want to please the Lord, especially in your youth. That's why I'm so excited about this, the bright spot, because when I was saved at nine years old, oh, it was so wonderful. I think, well, I'm never going to sin again. Uh, I'm going to go back in the fourth grade next year. I'm going to witness to Daryl and Max and Joe, and I, I can remember all of these things I was going to do, and, and uh, it just seemed so wonderful. It was like heaven on earth. It was truly that first love. But one thing I experienced afterwards, 
just doesn't work out that way. And it was in that sincerity and purity of my youth, and that's like with the bright spot, we need to reach kids that age so they can get excited about that first love and serving the Lord that I had when I was a boy. But then as time went by, I thought, well, yeah, I still, I know the Lord, but there were still times through those 50 years plus of living the Christian life when the things that would bother me and bring tears to my eyes when I was nine years old, I just I guess I just can handle it more now. No, it isn't that I can handle it anymore. It's that my heart isn't as soft as it used to be. See, we need to be growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord. And that doesn't make us more hard-hearted and to where we can deal with, I can handle this in my life now and I can handle this and I can do this and get away. No. We need to get to the place where we can still get down on our knees before God and, and just, I, th I think, really weep over our own, our own need for getting on with God. And so that's what one of these purposes is. And then, to come forth the finer, the third portion here. God has a lesson for, to learn in every trial, whether that is coming to godly repentance that we talked about or trusting more fully in God's sustaining grace, as Paul found out. Humility with a heartfelt reliance upon God's grace and strength are results. See, this is preparation for the glory to follow, but preparation in our lives right now. Humility with a heartfelt reliance upon God's grace and strength are results of going through deep waters of affliction. We don't know what it means to trust in God and to draw upon His strength and His grace in time of need unless He allows and brings along times of difficulty, times of affliction. And I know it's different from individuals. Sometimes it's just... And to think of the suffering and body that so many are going through years on end. And you see some of the distress in family situations and, and just things that are, are so seemingly so difficult for anyone to deal with. But see, God allows these things in his omniscience into the lives and into the experience of God's children. So why? Lord, I don't know what to do, but Lord, may your will be done and not mine. And then to commit that unto the Lord. And whatever his answer might be, if we genuinely say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done concerning these things that we're called upon to pray about. Because, see, prayer brings about the will of God upon earth and the intercessory prayer for ourselves and others. But then to honestly say, Lord, but if it's not your will to deal with the way I think it ought to be done, then to experience that strength, and grace and the abiding fullness of the Spirit of God that will enable us to rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory even now, as well as when we will see our Savior face to face. The finest refined qualities come forth after that you have suffered a while. Turn to chapter 5 and verse 10. Listen to this blessed text. And I'm going to read verses 9 also because this has to do with our opposition of that wicked one in this world. Whom resist, whom resist steadfast in the faith, that's the devil himself, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. See, there's going to be afflictions that Satan is going to be the, the instigator of. God allows it. See, God brings it into our lives. But yes, it can be satanic at times. But notice this knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. See, it's all of us. We're all in this boat. It's always been that way. It's always going to be that way until the Lord returns again. And so none of us are exempt from us. All of us need this kind of a study. Here's verse 10. Listen to this. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. Pretty bright future. Yeah. After, 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 I've got that circled in my Bible. After that ye have suffered a while, might seem like a lifetime, might seem like a long illness, might seem like a difficult marriage, it might seem like a difficult relation. But after ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, that means mature in Christ, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory 
and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The finest refined qualities of our faith come forth after that you have suffered a while. And then finally, we need to patiently wait upon him. As we saw in that 10th verse of chapter 5, it is a while. It's not a whole lifetime, but it's a while. And it's after that while is finished that our Heavenly Father will provide a way of escape. He is the one, only one who knows how long it needs to be in this time of distress. God will never put the saint through more than he is enabled by the grace of God to bear. Of course, you know that text in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation. That's testing, trial, hardship, or whatever it might be. Taking you, but such as is common to man. See, this is, we're all in the same boat as, as Christians. But God is faithful who will not suffer you or allow you to be tempted or tested or tried above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now that might be a relief from that distress, that affliction, that trial. Or it might be the need for getting right with God and, and then he will resolve that according to his time and way as we get our hearts right with the Lord. Or it might be, like the Apostle Paul found, well, my grace is sufficient for thee, see? And therefore, I'm going to glory <laughs> in this new experience, this new reality I have of abiding in Christ because I didn't think I was going to be able to stand this another day. It's just been too difficult. I can't take it anymore. I need to find a way out, you know? Boy, it's just like that when we can go to the Lord in prayer and he can change that. Oh, Lord, may that your will be done. I, I, I just... I, listen, I can look back in my life, even in all honesty, that what Mrs. Hawking said about me, I thought that was pretty decent of her, <laughs> you know, because she could have said a lot more. But I, I think of times when uh, I've had the, the best relationship with the Lord is when I was in my deepest times of discouragement, whether I can still remember being in college and situation like this and through the years from time to time and it would be very heavy hard feeling very far away from God but just to be able to because of the text we've been looking at it's bringing people to the place because of affliction because of discouragement because of depression because of great need because of heartache because of a burden for our loved ones or friends or whatever, whatever the situation might be to where we say, oh, I can't take this anymore. And we go and get on our knees before the Lord and say, Lord, may your will be done. And that's, the, that's what is brought out also in the, in the text there is about the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it was when he was suffering for our, in that agony before his crucifixion. And he is our example to follow in his steps as far as that yieldedness to the will of the Father, even though that meant crucifixion on the cruel Roman cross. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. But see, that's when God can be the closest to you. That's when Christ will be that shepherd, that faithful creator. That's when the Holy Spirit of God, because when we pray according to the will of God for his will to be done, as Roman 8 tells, it, tells us, will work out for the, all for, for his honor and for his glory. That's when the Spirit of God, when we just say, I don't know how to pray as I ought. But Lord, I know I need help now. I need help in this situation. Lord, help me. May your will be done. Then the Holy Spirit of God, even though we're not able to articulate the problem, let alone the right answer, it says the Holy Spirit of God intercedes with us, within us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And the, the Father knows, and the Spirit knows the, the will of the Father, and the Father knows the Spirit. See, there's a unity there. Going to, to God in prayer in the name of the Son in the Holy Spirit for the Father's will to be done. So you've got a, a, a union there of the Trinity that is interceding and praying for us when we just say, Lord, I don't know what to do, but Lord, help me. Give me the grace. Give me the strength. Give me relief if it's your will. Give me that repentance that I need if I'm not where I should be with you in my relationship daily. And I guarantee you, 
because I believe the Bible guarantees us. It's those types of times in our lives that God brings trials, difficulties our way to drive us to our knees to say, Lord, I need your will. I want your will. I'm so thankful I got the Holy Spirit of God within that will be able to work in and through me to produce that fruit of meekness, which is resignation after long suffering to the will of God, even though we don't know all the outcome. And then just to see and rejoice as the Apostle Paul did. He says, therefore, I will glory in my infirmities, for then the power <laughs> of Christ and the power of the Spirit of God rests upon me. May this be our experience in the truth of the Word of God in our relationship with Christ today. Our Heavenly Father, we just pray, dear God, that we might be so thankful as a people today that we are counted along in the same number of those that the Apostle Peter, by the inspiration of the Spirit of God from Christ, wrote to, because that was for all of the brethren suffering for the cause of Christ and suffering as, as a believer. But it's true for us today in 2009 as well. Dear Lord, make us people that are more people of sincere, earnest prayer for the situations that thou hast allowed into our lives to cause us to be more realistic and honest before thee with respect to sin in the heart and, and carnality, to confess that is sin and forsake it, but also to trust in thee for a, a marvelous answer to prayer and miraculous if it's thy will and deliverance from it, but also understanding that there'll never be anything that you bring our way that'll be too much to bear, but the way of escape will be found, and that is through trusting Christ, yielding to the will of God to be done, and to have that perfect work done in us through suffering for thy glory. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.